My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach and author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life, and you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times, and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. Today, I am delighted to welcome Adjua Okoto to the podcast. Adjua is a British Ghanaian actor, writer, model, and entrepreneur. You may have seen her in 2020's breakout TV show, I May Destroy You, for HBO and BBC a comedy drama exploring the question of sexual consent in contemporary life. And she's got some fascinating projects in the works as well, which I'm sure we'll hear a bit about. I was really interested to feature Adjua on the Unlock Moment podcast, as her path into acting was pretty unconventional. She studied economics and finance at university, and she's maintained a parallel career in the business world of skincare and wellness, as she's pursued her passion for acting. Her skincare brand, Dwira, that's spelled D-W-I-R-A, bridges decades of Ghanaian traditions, skincare, and wellness rituals with British good manufacturing practice standards to offer the best of both worlds. I can't wait to hear more about what drives her and how she balances her priorities as she targets success and fulfillment in her career. And of course, the moment of remarkable clarity where she figured out the right path ahead. Adjua, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Unlock Moment. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for joining. So start out with telling us a little bit about your story, a bit about your upbringing. Oh, right. Oh, so I am British Ghanaian. I was born in the UK and I lived here for uh, a few of my formative years. I, I want to say until about seven me and my family, we debate this all the time, but um, I did move to Ghana uh, for about three, four years. Again, another debate. <laughs> and I I came back to the UK in time to start year seven. So that's our secondary school. Um, we have very strong accents. <laughs> and what kind of child were you? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I've always been creative. I've always kind of been, I used to write a lot. Um and I used to write books and my mom always says, you know, oh my God, I should have published a book. So yeah, you should. <laughs> but I remember no one would read my books because I am from a very traditional African background, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. And it was always about studying um, to be a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant. It was never really about fiction. Like, you know, it was all make believe what I was doing. Um, so it wasn't something that my parents wanted to encourage, not because they um I guess just because they didn't know that was a viable path of a career way for me so they just wanted me to focus on what could make me successful um which they all thought I would be a lawyer because I I guess I loved to debate I was a child that always asked why and um in the African household again you just get told you don't ask and I'm always like but why but why and like I remember my dad used to say he had a say in children should be seen and not heard and I, and you could hear me so yeah I was that child that you couldn't really I wasn't the quiet child in the corner I was definitely the one that took control I was definitely the one that was you know I was like the the bossy big sister the the, the, the cousin that told you what to do I was I was that kind of child so yeah and where did the where did the bug for acting start for you? Right from a kid, you know. I think when I think of my earliest childhood memories, and when my cousins or my siblings, um, you know, my my earliest childhood memories were dancing, you know, dancing competitions, dancing shows, uh, films or plays, I should say, plays, gymnastics, all with me at the helm orchestrating it. Like everyone knew where to stand. It was me. I'm telling you, you're standing here, you're doing this and everyone's just going along for the ride. 
I actually remember vividly my sister being like, I don't want to play. I'm like, you have to play. <laughs> oh God, I sound so militant. But um, those are my earliest childhood memories. And actually those are the earliest childhood memories for a lot of my family as well. Like when we, when we talk about being together, it's one of my, my projects. <laughs> so I don't remember a time that I wasn't creating. We'll come and talk about some of your strengths later. Uh, you're one of the people that, that we've worked together before mm -hmm. uh, on on strengths. And one of your top five strengths, which is in the population, a very uncommon strength, but is something called command, which is this mm -hmm. uh, natural comfort with being the person that steps forward and says, this is what everybody should be doing. It's exactly what you you describe as, as a young child. It's quite interesting how 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 young some people are when those strengths start to to show up. So how do you balance that kind of um, the the creative spirit and the kind of family dynamic of, you know, doctor or lawyer or, you know, engineer, those kind of roots? Oh, I think I, so like from a very young age, I've had a lot of responsibility. Like my mum called me um, the second mum because I'm the oldest girl. And even though I'm the second born, I often felt like the oldest because I had an older brother and he also listened to me a lot. So um, it it often felt like I was in charge of of them a lot. And I it's weird because I think when you when you have that responsibility, um, I almost like thought of them as my children, right? Like my brother and my sister. So I, I almost kind of I don't think I put my needs on the back burner, but as I grew I I started to think, you know, the kind of background I come from, I can't afford to not have, you know, I can't afford to to kind of take a risk with my life. And I, I think when you're young and you're kind of trying to figure it out, everything is very black and white and there's no gray area. And for me, I was like, I always wanted to be the best. So I, I knew I was, I was quite good academically as well. So I was just like, you know, I, and everyone told me I was going to be a lawyer because I, I could debate really well and I could really present an argument. Like if we had to convince mum and dad to do something, if we had to, it was Adwa, send Adwa in and I'd go in and on the spot, I would make things up, which again is actually performance. I remember I'd stand there and think I was like a politician or a lawyer and I'd, and I'd really like even gesticulate, like I, my whole body language. I don't even know the content of what I was saying, but I know whatever passion I gave to them was so, like they'd laugh. So um, yeah, I guess like I, I started to subscribe to this notion that I was going to be a lawyer and I started to pick subjects and started to really um, gear my career path to being a, a lawyer. And I remember I... I was still acting because I loved it. And my school actually um, funded for me. They gave, I was part of this scholarship. I think it was the Hackney Young Actors um, Club. I can't remember the, the exact name, but it took part at the Hackney Empire, which is like a huge theatre in East London. And I got to go there every week and perform and act. And um, yeah, so for me, that was like a really nice outlet to have. It didn't feel like I was giving it up, but in the same breath, I was still in school and I was learning towards being a lawyer and I just felt it was both performance and some you know like that used language and I I get to speak and not be um scared to speak and, and in my mind I was going to be a barrister so I was like well when I'm representing people in court I need to know how to present myself I need to know how to do this so it kind of married like married together in my mind um I didn't make a definitive choice because I didn't think I had to at that point so you went to university and you studied economics and finance and, and what happened when you came out of university what what happened with your career so just as a, a side note to university actually because I'm talking about being a lawyer and I went to do economics and finance but I was such a it's weird I wasn't a rebellious child but I really wanted to live life on my own terms that I remember when I got into college I started to do like history and law kind of subjects and think I don't want to do law anymore I don't want to be a lawyer and then my dad was like well why don't you try being a doctor so then I dropped all my subjects the other option. Yeah, <laughs> within a month of starting, and I did because I was in five A levels, and I did all um, science subjects, which I absolutely hated. I hated that even more, um, but I couldn't drop it at that point, so I had to go through with it. And they weren't my strong suit, and it was one of the worst decisions I think because I didn't do well in like two of them. But and I had drama as one of the subjects, just as a side note. But so going on going into uni, I knew I couldn't try and pursue the drama path. That was very clear to me still. I didn't want to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a doctor. 
what was the next um, best option? And I knew if I wasn't an actor, like I always knew I wanted to be a businesswoman. You know, my mom in her early days was a businesswoman. And I just loved like the whole kind of lifestyle of it and her like just being a businesswoman. So I thought I'm going to... Um, I'm going to pursue finance because I learned that a lot of accountants were natural CEOs or they went on to start their own businesses. They understood finance. So I decided to study economics and finance. And you came through that Mm -hmm. and you went into, into business after you, after you graduated? No, no. Oh my goodness. So I, oh God, again, I was working. I, got a job as young as I could I think 14 years old I was in like a paper round or something um so I've always worked from the age of about 14 and right before I went to uni a university I got a job in the bank which at the time I was super young to get a job at the bank and no one around me had got it so everyone was like oh my god this is amazing so after uni I kind of went into that full time um whilst exploring other options and I, I think it was really a stalling tactic because I really shouldn't have and I was pursuing acting, but not really pursuing that. I think I was lost. I was I was very lost the early, um, the early kind of days after uni, and then I kind of I had to like with the pressure of like family, I just had to make a decision, and I I went into accounting, which I decided in uni I wouldn't do, and but I ended up doing, and um, yeah, spent a few years just kind of feeling very. Like I moved a lot as well. Like I, I thought I thought it was a company. I went like to smaller. I tried different firms and became apparent to me that it wasn't for me. How did you know? I hated going to work, and I think that's such a strong word to use. But nothing that inspired me on a daily. I felt, and a lot of people had kind of said, "Oh, this is what it's like after university. This is what adulthood is like." So I was just like, "This adulting, like this is such a dry life." <laughs> like we. And I, I think, not even I think, I know that in my my heart, I always knew, like, life was meant to be more than this. And I, I very quickly said to myself, I'm not a nine to five person. I'm not a nine to five person. This doesn't work for me. So actually, this is a story that I forget most of the time, and I shouldn't because it's such a huge, huge kind of part of my life. The next job I went, so I decided to leave the industry of accounting and didn't know what I wanted to do but just knew um I needed to make good money and it couldn't get in the way of my like I couldn't have a nine-to-five job and also I had to it had to make me feel good that was so huge in the terms of like not just feel good for myself but feel like I was making an impact on the world and I I found what a job that I thought was like amazing because it was um, for an NGO. It was a night. I mean, they had different roles, but I applied for the night job, which I remember going into the interview. They were so shocked that I'd applied for like the night role. It was manic and it was new and it was so innovative. And there was just so much scope to put your own mark on it because no one knew what they were doing. So we we were almost like making it up. And I was one of the first cohort, I think maybe the like second intake. So it was it was quite exciting. It was new. It was intense. But that is where I spent at least like two, three years. And what were you actually doing there? I was managing. Well, I wasn't managing. I was like an A&E reconnection worker. So we were working to like rehouse people who had like it, it was housing. So I guess if you had like it was and it was emergency housing. So it wasn't like, you know, you've been homeless for like two weeks. It was first time homeless people um, and you had nowhere to go. And it was like a very quick response. And we had to kind of try and get you rehoused in like 72 hours. That was our target. It feels like a huge contrast from what you described as this very dry world of banking and accounting. But, you know, reasonably well paid and so on. And suddenly you're thrust into this world of the NGO where you're doing something sort of deeply impactful, deeply important to yeah. people. How did it feel transitioning from one to the other? It was drama. Do you know, I remember, I think at the time I wasn't acting, but that was a stage because... I met people from all walks of life and I'm talking from like really kind of your trust fund kids who like have been cut off by their parents to people who had no status in the country and had to leave. And I think for me, I then had to really start to adapt my communication skills and learn how to deal with different people of different ages, of different backgrounds. I was thrust in the deep end. I it was so exciting. I think the first few years for me was so exciting because I was making such a huge change. Like I remember people would come back and like give me gifts or cry. Like I made 
I want to say friends, but I couldn't keep in contact with them. But I made, I made connections that will stay with me for a lifetime in the sense of, I don't hear from those people, but how like they made me feel or how I made, how they told me I helped them or made them feel. I will never forget that ever, you know? So I felt impactful. And for a few years, I think because I felt impactful and because I was making a change and also I had my days, so I didn't feel like I was giving up my life. But what I didn't realize was I was giving up my energy. So I just didn't have the same energy to put into pursuing what I wanted to pursue. And then when I did start to pursue what I wanted to pursue, it was so hard because I would literally come off a 12 hour shift. I'd finish at like 8.30 a.m., drive home, take a shower, sleep for maybe an hour or two. And then I might have an addition at 10 10 a.m. or maybe like 12 or something, you know, it was it was tough because we and at the time we weren't doing self tapes. You had to go into the room and, you know, do that whole kind of spill. So I started to see the friction of. I've got the acting bug, it's come back again. And I've got this job that I really love and I'm enjoying, but I, I, it was also getting to a point where I was burning out. A lot of things of, had changed. So I was delivering a lot more bad news because of government regulations. It meant we just couldn't and didn't have the funding to help as much as we could. And I remember feeling like an imposter in a sense of I would befriend these people and they would be telling me what their wants and needs were. And I would know, I would know that we couldn't give them what they wanted. And at the time, it was all about encouraging them to take the, the offer that we were going to present to them. And I did not want to do that. It's so interesting hearing the way that you tell this story. And it's one of the reasons that I was so keen to to get you on to, to, to talk about the journey you've been on, because this connection with purpose and authenticity is so important to you i know that's true it's something that i write a lot about you know and it's 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 part of my thinking around the idea mindset the a of idea is authenticity and hearing those three phases so the the gray dull but profitable world of banking and accountancy the inspiring and meaningful and impactful first phase of your of your time at the NGO. And then this transition to where, you know, a a drive for something that is passionate and meaningful for you at some point, you know, driven by the intensity of the work, the nature of the messages you're having to give, that kind of thing starts to impact you personally. It's a very common sort of flow for people where, you know, they're, they're, they're pursuing something that is really important to them. But it's difficult sometimes to keep those sort of barriers and those boundaries up. And did you did you feel that that it was hard to sort of separate the work from Oh yeah, I had to like I had a, a a ritual when I got home of like how to like wash away the work because physically I remember at the time understanding why I'd read at one point psychologists have psychologists I thought what that doesn't even make sense I was you know a lot younger and, and then after like at this job I started to understand why um because you really are like people really are offloading their problems onto you and it's that 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 period made me the most grateful I'd ever been in my life because I realized my problems in comparison were nothing I think when you talk about like barriers for me it became um it was it was strong because I I started to feel like okay I'm advancing and you know and like I said it was still quite a new and even though like I'd been there about three years, it was still quite a newish, um, like a lot of people didn't know about it. And I would make suggestions and without going into too many details, which I felt were really good and were really helpful. And because I was being promoted, I I could have a bit more of a, a direct kind of, not influence, but direct uh, feedback from the top and, you know, be in these rooms where we discuss it. And I, I felt like the structure was too rigid and I didn't feel like the structure was, adaptable and I think at that point for me I realized I can't make the change here that I wanted to or that I feel that I want to and actually I'm going to work and doing things I don't want to do and saying things to people I don't want to say and having to deliver them offers and I started to do this thing right well I've left now and I I said well you should look around you have options (laughs) and you're not supposed we 
that's not our job but i i started to do that so i was and i that meant i wouldn't hit target we started to have these really strong targets as well so i just it it felt a lot like banking to me actually when we started to talk about targets but now it felt like banking with real people's lives you know like yeah and i knew for me that you know it, i wouldn't be here for much longer and i hope the listener can tune into this narrative of the shift in how it feels to be doing what you're doing and it's it's easy and difficult to say to people listen to your gut because in in a way everybody knows what that means and in a way it's actually pretty difficult to really understand what you mean by that but you know what you're feeling is this sense of there's a shift what felt good and positive and productive and impactful before that that those dynamics are starting to shift now so bring me into this unlock moment for you so what was happening for you when you reached this point of sort of remarkable clarity as the path ahead I managed to move into like another NGO like felt more impactful but I wasn't there for long because I think at that point I'd already like I was kind of I'd gone in and I was thinking if this is the same spill we have to do I'm out because now I was actually out there like I would literally go out on the streets I was able to see exactly like whereas before I was in an office and I was actually able to go and do outreach work and actually be outside it was kind of both I was in the office as well but I also had you know times where I'd actually go out and kind of see what was going on and like be on the ground you know grassroots so to speak but I think at that point I, I kind of knew it wasn't about the work anymore it was about me feeling like I wasn't maximizing the impact I could have here. So I I took a step back and I was really thinking about my life and it took a while to get here, but the kind of, I guess the purpose element came into play and it was like, what is my purpose on li- like in life? What is my purpose? Because I, I so obviously want to impact these people, but I want to be an actor. How does that even correlate? And I remember it came to me and I was like, well, you know, like if I just follow the path that I want to do and follow my gut, I can be a lot more influential. I can actually change the narrative. I could I could start my own NGO if I wanted to, but by following my own path, I get to decide how I impact people and how I can help out people without the, the rigid structure of someone else's corporation. That was like the first point where I knew for me, ownership was where it was at. It's about being able and having the freedom and flexibility to do and live life on my own terms and acting and entrepreneurship which I'd always loved gave me that outlet so I, I I didn't know why I continued to shy away from it so it was realizing that the purpose was something about being able to have impact but the route through which you could have that impact had a broader range of options than you'd been considering uh, I think more so just knowing that following my dreams and my guts would make me the most impactful than anything else I've done. You know, like for me, it was, I listened to everyone else my whole life on how I should live my life. I listened to my parents. I'd listened to like input from friends and religious leaders. I'd listened to work colleagues. I'd always known in my heart, this did not align with my spirit, but I'm thinking I'm too young to make these decisions. And then I look around and I'm like, well, whose life do I want? <laughs> I want my own life. And I got to a stage where I was so fed up by life like my life, I, I I felt like I'd just fallen into my life. I I didn't choose this life and I was living it and I did not like it. And I'm like, well, why don't I change the narrative and start doing what I actually want to do? I really like that. Yeah, I mean, there was, and it was a quote that came to me and I was like, whoa, as actors, especially like, you know, we all want to, we always want to do things and we're like, oh, but we're getting older. And I, I think it's, it's so funny because I, I was, I can't remember where I was, but I saw this quote and the quote was something along the lines of, I'm not worried about your next 10 years, which I was worried about my next 10 years. But the quote was like, I'm not worried about your next 10 years. I'm worried about your last 10 years. When you're 80 or 90 and you're on your deathbed or you're talking to people, you're talking to your family about your life or you're reflecting on your life. What does it read? What does it say? And then it clicked for me. I was like, everything in between it's just the journey for me it became it became real like I was like whoa whoa like it's the fun of just knowing that 
being a part of that journey is what that's where you're going to get the most of your life experiences that's where you live that's where life you're lifing I like to use this word lifing which isn't a real word but for me I was like it's about the lifing like why am I sitting on because what was the alternative was climbing up the corporate ladder or the management ladder and having a family and having children and having a white picket fence and it sounds lovely but it was never the life that I wanted you know I still want a family and all those things but I knew it couldn't be in a neatly tied box and you know like nice little ribbon mine was always going to be different it was always going to be a bit more rogue it was always going to be a bit more adventurous and I was like well let's do it let's start this adventure so your unlock moment was was this clarity around taking ownership of the path ahead for you. And you keep using this word impact. Oh, okay. Unpack that for me. Impact on who? Do you know, I never even realized I've used the word impact so much until you mentioned it. And you're right, I've probably mentioned it a few times. When I think of impact, I think of the world, actually. I think of the world and, you know, I was going to say people, but no, it's actually the world because, and it's something I've been reflecting on a lot this last two months because I've been doing a lot of self-work and a lot of getting to know myself, which Clifton Strengths helped with. But I've been thinking of, you know, like I'm reading um, The 5am Club by Robin Sharma and there's a line in there that one of the characters says and is like, who would cry when you die? They talk about this notion of becoming 1% better every day, which I love because, my mind is I never start at like zero. Like we always look at people who are doing things that we want and we compare ourselves to them. And it's, we're comparing our beginning to their end, which is ludicrous. Like, why do we do that? Because what it does is it sets these unrealistic expectations. And when you don't get it straight away for myself, I'd like scarper away from whatever it was that I was trying to achieve. And actually, when I think of breaking these huge goals, which your idea mindset also goes into, into, into small actionable goals or you know, task, it now becomes a lot more real and solid. And I guess for me, it was like, okay, so he's talking about becoming 1% better. It's a who would cry when you die. And I realize I'm at, at some point, I realize I'm just living to live. Like, I, what is my life? You know, yeah, maybe I bring joy to the people in my immediate circle, but I don't feel like I, I knew my purpose at the time. I didn't feel like I. I was making any impact. I didn't think I was changing or making the world a better place than it was when I got here. And for me, I think humans probably all think their like purpose is different, but I know I have this urge and I know I have this in me that I need to leave the world in a better place than when I got here. How do you describe your why? My why is giving a part of me to you. You know, like giving a part of me to you that, changes you in a way that is positive or leaving a part of me in this world that changes it in a way that is positive I like to think singularly just because I think we impact people more or well like we make more of an impact when we think of one thing we want to impact as opposed to I want to do this for the world sometimes you don't realize creating one thing or like just focusing on the singular actually does impact the world in some way shape or form that's interesting yeah no that I mean that's something I also had to like kind of dial back because when you have my kind of and I like even like you know I've got activator and I was listening to the the kind of notions we love starting things <laughs> we love starting so many things we think on the grand scale so we talked about before the journey through your career of discovering the sense of purpose and connecting with this authenticity and impact and even after you said, I didn't realize I said it very much, <laughs> you keep saying it. And then when I said to you, what do you mean by impact, impact for who? You thought about it very carefully. And then you said, impact on the world, which is um, admirable and massive as a goal. And then actually you came to a place where you said, but I recognize that sometimes I need to focus on the one thing to really make something happen. For a lot of people, I've worked with quite a lot of people where they are naturally high performers, they are ambitious, they are often competitive, or they're maximizers, they're looking to make things world class. And it's quite easy sometimes to get kind of lost in a desire to achieve something so huge that you end up 
not actually getting cut through. So if you were to say, if you could do just one thing in terms of having impact, if you could look back on your life in that sort of last 10 years and think, here's something where I really made a difference, what would you be proud to have impacted? Creating stories, I'd say. For who? For who? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that's an interesting one. I think I want to create stories that I've I've grown up seeing. You know, I want to create stories that I can relate to. I want to create stories that make myself and people like me feel seen. I I think of like an off like often I speak about this and there's like a niche gap where I'm British Ghanaian and I love that there's a lot more African and diverse stories being told. I still feel like we could push that narrative. Like I always say to people, and I, I say, you know, I don't think yet I've seen me represented. I I come from two different continents. And I know like some people are like, oh, you have to choose if you're African or if you have to choose if you're British. I've just spent the last six months of last year in Ghana on my own without my family. Like, you know, it's where my family are from, but I've never been there without my family. And it was such an eye-opening experience filled with beautiful experiences and also a lot of frustration. And, you know, I'm not the only person who has kind of made that move back and I think that was the beautiful part of it it was like a melting uh, of different cultures in the sense of there was African Americans uh, European Ghanaians you know like there was so many different cultures that had come back home and Eva had moved home or were visiting or um, kind of just like maybe there for a few months and so I got to like connect with a lot of different people and we definitely have our own world in the sense of a lot of people didn't completely feel like they belonged to like for instance I don't feel like I'm completely British but also there are parts in Ghana where you don't feel like you're completely gone in because they remind you that actually you know you are other and that might also come from a place of privilege because you do have a slight privilege sometimes you know when you and I say sometimes because there are a lot more like Ghanaians who are also very privileged but then the, the masses who aren't see you as this girl that's come from this world and you have a bit of a privilege there right so I remember thinking well where exactly do I belong and I've had this conversation with people you really kind of have to create that home for yourself like you really do but when I was there a lot of the stories that inspired me I realized was this world of belonging to multiple countries or multiple homes which I think a lot of people could probably relate to more so than others that I don't really see and I think we are increasingly becoming a more international you know people don't live in just one place or very rarely like you know live in one place I speak to so many people who actually are bi-coastal or tri-coastal or you know would kind of navigate to where they might live a few years here and then decide they don't want to live here and move you know we live in that world a lot more now these days you know we have a lot a huge remote work in um, the digital nomad generation that travel the world and live life on their own terms and I love that and I think for me I was like I just want to really see people like myself who have that hybrid um, nationality be represented a lot more so then I started to get a lot of inspiration for stories that bridge that gap and I guess when I say I'm creating, it's it's for me to, it really is allow people to understand my world and by an extension, our world, anyone else who connects with that same world. If you were going back into a school in London um, and you were sitting down with a group of maybe 12-year-old or 14-year-old girls of British Ghanaian heritage and talking to them about their future and what you've learned on your journey what what would you say to them oh I love this question I absolutely love it uh just before I go into what I would say I'll tell you why I love it um so I'm an actress and a lot of people talk about coming into the arts coming into the arts as therapy I remember thinking that in my early days and then really not liking it because I'm like well if it's therapy 
it means you're running away from your actual life. And I, I felt like I was. I was playing pretend and lots of people were playing pretend to run away from their lives. And a teacher I had ever, she was just like, it's just fun. Like, it's just fun. And when it comes down to the nitty gritty, it should just be fun. But one thing that acting did for me that changed me, and it's done a lot of things for me, but changed me fundamentally as a person was I was trying to book roles by playing someone else and I never booked those roles and the more I learned about my craft and the more I became a better actress I realized and it is the notion of acting essentially and everyone in your nana will tell you this all the cast and directors all the directors the producers everyone who's in the industry will tell you the actors that book are so authentically themselves they bring themselves to every situation the audition the set they are so themselves because you know what? You are so unique. The attributes that you try and hide, the attributes you don't like, the attributes that make you you can never be anyone else. And that's the beauty of each and every one of us. So when I just started to lean into me and not what, what would a casting director want? What would the director want? Not only was I having the time of my life, just having fun, I started to book work. And I've started to apply that principle to all areas of my life. So I guess when I go into these schools, what I'm saying to these young girls is, or boys or young people is, be you, but be authentically you. You know, really, really focus on finding out who you are as a person, because that is the most joyful experience. My God, I've been playing a part so for so long, I didn't even know who I was or what I wanted anymore. And I have joy now learning why I react a certain way to things or why certain things trigger me or why certain things make me really happy or why I am drawn to certain things. And the more I learn about myself, and that's why I love the idea mindset so much. It was the Clifton Strength profile. I had so many aha moments that made me think I'm leaning away from these attributes and I'm not leaning into my, my strengths and thus my greatness. Because when you lean into your strengths, that is what's going to get you from point A to point Z. You know, that's what's going to take you where you want to go. So I guess, yeah, it's just about telling these young people, you already kind of have what you know, what you have in you. And I want to be very like clear that I'm not saying you shouldn't improve because there were things that I didn't have that were holding me back or are holding me back from having the career that I want. And I've highlighted those things and I'm working towards those things. But you really have to lean into being authentically, authentically you. It is the crutch of your life, honestly. The minute you start learning who you are and leaning into it, your life will absolutely change. And for the best as well. And the moment where you really figured that out was when? Oh, child, when did I figure that out? <sighs> You know, it's one of those messages you hear over and over again. And I, I've started to realise a lot of things that I'm having my aha moments are not brand new. I've always heard them before, but it just didn't click. Because maybe I wasn't in the right mental space or physical space or whatever space, emotional space. When was the moment I really figured it out? I want to say when I was, uh, it was during the pandemic, for sure. It was definitely during the pandemic but yeah yeah you know what it was it was the pandemic and there was a point where in my mind I was like the world is probably going to end oh my goodness this is it for us and I remember thinking to myself thank god I quit my job a year ago because for the last year I've been living the life of my dreams I realized I had chosen the life I'd lived in the last year and it, was a, it wasn't an easy year, by the way, because, you know, I, it was the first time in my life I didn't have consistent money coming through. I was having to fund myself with my house fund, the money I'd saved for a house. So it wasn't an easy um, time period for me. My God, was it fun? Was it adventurous? It was exhilarating. And I realized at that point, I had been living authentically me. And that's what I love. So 
it was definitely, I think, at a point where it felt like the world could end, which sounds really drastic, but really and truly, we've all just lived through one of a, 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 a one of life's probably most most life changing errors. Really, I think this will go down in history. But um, it was when I guess and this sounds so dire. I don't like saying death, but it was when I felt like I was being faced with death, and I wasn't scared to die. And I think just to put that in context, I used to be so fearful of death. Like I always used to think I do not want to die before my time because I do not want to die before I've left my legacy or my impact, that word again. And I felt like at that point I was on my journey to where I needed to go. And even if I did go, I was going doing what I loved. This is why I love podcasting. (laughs) This part of the conversation is why I love podcasting because if we're doing an interview, you're doing a media mm-hmm. interview, someone feels like they need to ask you another question to fill in those gaps. Um, in 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 the idea mindset, I have this phrase that's something like, you have to give your brain space and time to do the thinking that it needs to do. And sometimes to find these remarkable moments of clarity, one of which you've just described, you just need to take the time to stop and think. And what I loved about that moment that you just had was you didn't know the answer to the question I just asked you. And you really had to think about it and explore. And when you found it, you realized how impactful a thing it was. And as a lesson to people listening, not about this particular topic, it's very personal to to you. You know, this, this, this is, this this is, this is not other people's challenge necessarily. And so other people's question, but being comfortable to have that moment of silence, and to genuinely do the thinking and just wait until it comes. That's how you find clarity. I have this little quote where I say to people, you can't think to a deadline. Oh. Which, By which I mean, if I tell you that you've got to figure it out by four o'clock on Friday afternoon, well, you're going to come to the best answer you can by four o'clock on Friday afternoon. Sometimes all you've got to do is give it the time it takes. And when you give it the time, the conclusion you're going to come to is is so much more powerful a conclusion. And I, I'm I'm absolutely fascinated by hearing you go through that journey just in the conversation we've had around what impact really means, who you really want to be telling your story to, what you're really going to be proud of in the long term. Uh, and it just helps you have that clarity and, and focus. It does. I didn't even realize a lot of the answers to the questions that you're asking me I've never really thought about in so much detail so this has been really kind of enlightening for myself as well so sit here at the early in summer of 2022 what's coming up for you what you're excited about over the next six to twelve so months? much <laughs> no I'm playing well I'm not playing but yeah um I I have a few projects coming out, which is really exciting, some of which I can't mention. I have two TV dramas coming out on Sky. Uh, I've got a feature film. One of the one is a horror, and I play the lead in that, which is really, really cool. And I have another feature film, musical feature film coming out. I've also filmed a comedy TV series in that. It's probably going to come out early next year. And I'm working on creating, which I'm so, so excited about. Um, I I am represented as a writer now as well. So I'm going to be delving into that a hell of a lot more. Um, And I'm really excited for you to like see that aspect of me that I haven't really shared a lot of before. So yeah. And also my my African skincare wellness brand, we are rebranding and expanding in a huge way. So we have skincare products, but we're going to be moving into food supplements and also wellness and digital courses so that's exciting and even in-person community courses so I'm really really excited to kind of meet some of our customers in real life and any creatives or any like other people like-minded people out there as well like in real life it would be really cool because as I I move in my life I've I've realized how much wellness and self-care and kind of preserving myself is so important to me and it allows me to do my best work and I've always kept those two aspects separate but I will be merging those a lot more so now even on my personal platform I'll be sharing a hell of a lot more of my current journey um, my current routines and the things I put in place to make me have the best most optimal life that I can have for myself 
Fantastic. And where can people find out more about so you? So my website is currently um, under construction, but you can find me on social media. So across Instagram or Twitter, it's Adwa, that's A-D-W-O-A, Akoto, A-K-O-T-O, underscore. Fantastic. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. For actor, writer, and businesswoman Adjua Akoto, it was when she figured out that she valued happiness over success when facing into a high-profile role and intentionally chose a different path that helped her build a life of her choosing, driven by a desire to live an authentic life. She's such an inspiration to young people, and I'm so pleased she's come in to share her story today. Adra, thank you so much for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you so much for having me. This was honestly such a great conversation. And I love I love everything that you're doing and sharing these stories because they're so needed and we so need to like understand how we get to where we get to via our strengths, via our life stories. And yeah, as I continue to share these amazing stories, I listened to a few and they blew me away. Thank you so much. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr. Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset, available in physical book, ebook, and audiobook formats. Follow me on Instagram and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Join me again soon.